Mary Slusser of Calabar, Pioneer Missionary by W.P. Livingston. Chapter 10 Mutinous. She was under official ruling to return to Akpap in April 1906, and she was now reminded of the fact. She was in great distress and inclined to be mutinous. There is an impelling power behind me, and I dare not look backward, she said. Even if it cost me connection with the church of my heart's love, I feel I must go forward. And again, I am not enthusiastic over church methods. I would not mind cutting the rope and going adrift with my barons, and I can earn our bite and something more. She had thoughts of taking a post under the government, or with the help of her girls, opening a store. In a letter to the Reverend William Stevenson, the Secretary of the Women's Foreign Mission Committee, she pointed out how her settlement at Aitu had justified itself, and referred to the rapid development of the country. In all this, how plainly God has been leading me. I have not a thought of such things in my lifetime, and nor indeed in the next generation. And yet my steps have been led, apart from any plan of mine, right to the line of God's planning for the country. First Aitu, then the creek, then back from Arrow, where I had set my heart to a solitary wilderness of the most forbidding description, where the silence of the bush had never been broken, and here, before three months are passed, there are miles of road, and miles and miles more, all surveyed and being worked upon by gangs of men from everywhere, and free labor is being created and accepted as quickly as ever a novelist could imagine, and the minutes say I am to return to Akpap in April. Oak Young and his people are very dear to me. No place on earth now is quite as dear. But to leave these hordes of untamed, unwashed, unlovely savages, and withdraw the little light that's begun to flicker out over its darkness, I dare not think of it. Whether the church permits it or not, I feel I must stay here, and even go on further as the roads are made. I cannot walk now, nor dare I do anything to trifle with my health, which is very queer now and then. But if the roads are all the easy gradient of those already made, I can get four wheels made and set a box on them, and the children can draw me about. With such facts pressing on me at every point, you will understand my saying, I dare not go back. I shall rather take the risk of finding my own chop if the mission do not see their way to go on. But if they see their way to meet the new needs and requirements, I shall do all of my power to further them without extra expense to the church. This, she characteristically added, is not for publication. It is for digestion. There had never, of course, been any intention on the part of the church to draw back from the task of evangelizing their new regions. But the various bodies responsible for the work were stewards of the money contributed for foreign missions, and they had to proceed in this particular part of the field according to their resources. Both men and means were limited, and had to be adjusted to the needs, not in an impulsive and haphazard way, but with the utmost care and forethought. All connected with the mission were as eager for extension as she was, but they desired it to be undertaken on thorough and business-like lines. The difference between them and her was one of method, she, all afire with energy and enthusiasm, would have gone on in faith. They, more prudent and calculating, wished to be sure of each step before they advanced another. To her great relief, she was permitted to have her way. When it was seen that she was bent on pressing forward, it was decided to set her free from ordinary trammels and allow her to act in future as a pioneer missionary. It was a remarkable position, not one without its difficulties and dangers, and one naturally that could not become common. But Mary Slusser was an exceptional woman, and it was to be the honor of the church that it at last realized the line of her genius, and in spite of being sometimes at variance with her policy, permitted her to follow her master in her own fashion. Her faith in the people and their own ability to support the work was proved more than once. It was a plucky thing for these men and women to become Christians, since it meant the entire recasting of their lives. Yet this is what was now being often witnessed. One event at Okana Abayo was to her a foretaste of heaven, the baptism of the chief and his slave wife and a baby, a score of her people, and sixteen young boys and girls, including one of the lads who had assisted to paddle the canoe on the day when the creek was first entered. She was ill, and was carried to and from the town in sharp pain and much discomfort, but she forgot her body in the rare pleasure she experienced at the sight of so many giving themselves to Christ. She had to hide her face on the communion table. Over forty sat down in the afternoon to remember our Lord's death till they come. It cannot go back, this work of his. Akani Obayo is now linked on to Calvary. She thought of those rejoicing above. I am sure our Lord will never keep it for my mother. The news from Erechuku was also cheering, although the messages told of persecution of the infant church by the chiefs, who threatened to expel the teachers if they spoiled the old fashions. And what did you say to that? she inquired. 
we replied, You can put us out of our country, but you cannot put us away from God. And the women? They said they would die for Jesus Christ. She was anxious to visit Erichuku again, but there had been exceptional rains, and the creek had risen above its usual height and flooded the villages. Akaneo Bayo suffered greatly, the church being inundated. The chief was downcast, and in his simplicity of faith thought God was punishing him, and searching his heart to find the cause, until Ma comforted him. He determined to rebuild the church on higher ground, and this intention he carried out later. About a mile further up the creek he chose a good site, and erected a new town called Obufu Abaya, the first to be laid out on a regular plan. The main street is about forty yards wide, and in the middle of it is the chief's house, with the church close by. The side streets are about ten yards wide. All the houses have lamps hanging in front, and these are lit in the evening. The boys have a large football field themselves. Chief Onoyam, who is one of the elders of Session, continues to exercise a powerful influence of good throughout the creek. One incident of the flood greatly saddened Mary. A native family was sleeping in their hut, but above the waters. The mother suddenly awoke at the sound of something splashing just below. Thinking it some wild animal, she seized a machete and hacked at it. Her husband also obtained his sword and joined in. When lights came, the mangled form of the baby, who had fallen from the bed, was seen in the red water. Distracting at having murdered her child, the woman threw herself into the creek and was drowned. So convinced was Mary of the importance of Erichuku, and so anxious to have a recognized station there, that she offered to build a house free of expense to the mission, if two agents would be sent up. This brought the whole matter of extension to a definite issue, and a forward movement was unanimously agreed on by the council, the ladies being specifically anxious for this, any developments to take place by the way of the Inyang Creek. A committee was appointed to visit Erichuku and to confer with Mary. Two ladies were actually appointed by the council, one being Miss Martha Peacock, who was afterwards to be so closely allied with herself. When these matters came before the Foreign Mission Committee in Scotland, a resolution was passed, which it is well to give in full. 1. That they recognized the general principle, that in all ordinary circumstances the woman's foreign mission should not make the first advance into new territory, but follow the lead of the Foreign Mission Committee, the function of the former being to supply the necessary complement to the work of the latter. 2. That, however, in view of a. the earnest desire of the people of the district in question to receive Christian training, and their willingness to help in providing it, b. the fact that the region had been claimed by the United Free Church as within the sphere of its operations, and has had this claim assigned by the Church Missionary Society, c. the steps which have already been taken by Miss Slusser, and that she is further prepared to do, they regard it not only highly desirable, but the duty of the Church to occupy the region in question as soon as it is possible. 3. That, in view, on the other hand, of the present condition of their funds, which are overtaxed by the already existing work, the committee deeply regrets that it is beyond their means to add two new members to the staff, as the council requests that, thereafter, the sending of two new agents to Erichuku must be meantime delayed. 4. That the committee, however, approve of the acceptance of the mission council of Miss Lesser's generous offer to build a house, but recommend the council to consider whether the extension of the work should not be delayed till there is a nearer prospect of new agents being supplied. They further return thanks to Miss Lesser for her generosity, and record their warm appreciation of her brave pioneer work. They express the earnest hope that the church, by larger liberality, may soon enable them to make the advance which has been so well prepared. Meanwhile, the Reverend John Franklin has been giving a roving commission in order to ascertain the best location for the future station, and he came back from a tour in Ibo and Ibibo, and fired the council for with the tale of what he had seen, and the wonderful possibilities of this great and populous region, close to Erichuku, within a circle, the diameter of which is less than three miles, there are, he said, nineteen large towns. I visited sixteen of these, each of which is larger than Creek Town. The people are a stalwart race, far in advance of Efik. The majority are very anxious for help. A section is strongly opposed, even to the point of persecution of those who are under the influence of Miss Lesser, and others have already begun to try to live in God's fashion. This opposition seems to be one of the most hopeful signs as proving that be at least no indifference. The head chief of all the arrows, who was the chief formerly in charge of the Long Juju, is one of those most favorable. He has already announced to the other chiefs his intention to rule in God's ways. He has been the most keen in asking the missionary to come. A new church will be built, and he offers to build a house for any missionary who will come. With something like enthusiasm, the committee set apart Mr. Franklin himself to take up the work at Erichuku, and accepted the responsibility for sending him at once. 
Thus, Irochuku, like Aitu, passed into the control of the Foreign Mission Committee and became one of their stations and became one of their stations in the center of further developments, and thus Miss Lesser's long period of anxiety regarding its position and future was at an end. Chapter eleven On the Bench Recognizing the Ma had an influence with the natives, which it was impossible to abrogate, the government decided to invest her with the powers of a magistrate. The native courts of Nigeria consist of a number of leading chiefs in each district, who take turns to try cases between native and native. The district commissioner is ex officio, president of those within his sphere, and each court is composed of a permanent vice president and three chiefs. Before the United Two, she was asked for she was asked informally whether she would consent to take the superintendent of court affairs in the district, as she had it done in Okiyang, but on an unrecognized basis. If she agreed, the court would be transferred to Ekotabong to suit her convenience and safeguard her strength. She was pleased that the government thought her worthy of the position, and it was favorable to the idea. Already she was by common consent to the chief arbiter in all disputes, and wielded unique power, but she thought that if she were also the official agent of the government, she might increase the range of her usefulness. Her aim was to help the poor and the oppressed, and especially to protect her own downtrodden sex and secure their rights, and to educate the people up to the Christian standard of conduct, and such an appointment would give her additional advantage and authority. It would be a good chance, she said, to preach the gospel and create confidence and inspire hope in these poor wretches, who fear white and black men alike, while it will neither hamper my work nor restrict my liberty. On stating that she would do the work, she was told that a salary was attached to the post, but she declared that nothing would induce her to accept it. I am born and bred, and am in every fiber of my being a voluntary. The formal offer came in May 1905 in the shape of this letter. Number 1. I am directed by His Excellency the High Commissioner to inquire whether you would accept office as a member of I2 Native Court with the status of Permanent Vice President. His Excellency is desirous of securing the advantage of your experience and intimate knowledge of Native affairs and sympathetic interest in the welfare of the villagers, in the welfare of the villagers, and understands that you would not be adverse to place your service at the disposal of the government. 2. It is proposed to assign you a nominal salary of one pound a year, and to hand you the balance, forty-seven pounds per annum, for use in forwarding your mission work. 3. It is proposed to transfer I-2 court to Ekotobong. She thanked the government for the honor and for the confidence reposed in her, and said she was willing to give her services for the good of the people in any way, but she declined to accept any remuneration. She took over the books in October acting then and often afterwards as clerk, and carrying through all the tedious clerical duties. It was strange and terrible, but to her not unfamiliar work. She came face to face with the worst sign of a low, down, savage people, and dealt with the queerest of queer cases. One of the first was a murder charge in which a woman was involved. Women were indeed at the bottom of almost every mischief and palaver in the country. With marriage was mixing up poisoning, sacrifice, exaction, oaths, debt, and cruelty unspeakable. Mary was often sick with the loathing of it all. God help these poor, helpless women, she wrote. What a crowd of people I have had today, and how debased. They are just like brutes in regard to women. I have had a murderer, in a Siri case, a suicide, a man for branding his slave wife all over her face and body, and a man with a gun who has shot poor people. It is all terrible. Here are three specimen charges and the results in her own writing. For imprisonment. O. Oh, I found guilty of brawling in market, and taking by force eight rods from a woman's basket. One month's hard labor. P. B. Chasing a girl into the bush with intent to injure. One month's hard labor. U. A. A. Seizing a woman in the market. B. Chaining her for fourteen days by neck and wrist. Throwing MBM with intent to kill, should she reveal it to a white man. Sentenced to six months' hard labor, and to be sent back on expiry of sentence to pay cost. She had the right of inflicting punishment up to six months' imprisonment, but often, instead of administering the law, she administered justice by giving the prisoner a blow on the side of the head. The oath taken was usually the heathen imbium, for this was needed a skull and a vial concoction in a bottle, which was kept outside the courthouse on account of the smell. After a witness had promised to speak the truth, one of the members of the court would take some of the stuff and draw it across his tongue and over his face and touch his legs and arms. It was believed that if he spoke falsely he would die. After Miss Lesser took up her duties, a heathen, a native, who had clearly borne false witness, dropped down dead on leaving the court, with the result that Imbium was in high repute for a time in the district. 
Although three local chiefs sat by her side on the bench, and the jury behind her, she ruled supreme. I have seen her get up, says a government official of that time, and box the ears of a chief because he continued to interrupt after being warned to be quiet. The act caused the greatest amusement to the other chiefs. They often writhed under her new edicts regarding women, but they always acquiesced in her judgment. For not providing water for twin mothers, she fined a town three pounds. Miss Amos tells of a woman wishing a divorce from her scamp of a husband. The court evidently thought she had sufficient cause, and there and then granted the request, and asked her colleague to witness the act. The woman was triumphant, feeling very important at having two white people on her side, while the man stood trembling, as Ma expressed her candid opinion of him. In the government report of 1907, it was stated that a number of summonses had been issued by the district commissioner against husbands of twin-bearing women for desertion and support, and in every case the husbands agreed to take the women back, the sequel being that other women in the same plight were also received back into their families. The result, says the report, is a sign of the civilizing influence worked through the court by the admirable lady, Miss Lusser. Some of her methods were not of the accepted judicial character. She would try a batch of men for an offense, lecture them, and then impose a fine. Finding they had no money, she would take them up to the house and give them work to earn the amount and feed them well. Needless to say, they went back to their homes, her devoted admirers. Her excuse for such irregular procedure was that, while they were working, she could talk to them and exercise an influence that might provide abiding in their lives. This was the motive animating all her actions in the court. When Ma Slusser presided, it was said, her master was beside her, and his spirit guided her. The court was popular, for the natives had their tales heard at first hand, and not through an interpreter. Ma's complete mastery of their tongue, customs, habits, and every nature gave her, of course, an exceptional advantage. When district commissioners spent three days in trying a single case, hearing innumerable witnesses, without coming within sight of the truth. In despair he sought her aid, and she settled the whole dispute to the satisfaction of everyone by asking two simple questions. It was impossible for any native to deceive her. A government doctor had occasion to interview a chief through an interpreter. She was standing by. As the chief spoke, she suddenly broke in, and the man simply crumpled up before her. The doctor afterwards asked what the chief had done. He told a lie. I reprimanded him. But I can't understand how he could possibly expect me not to know. Again and again she reverted to the matter. Do you think he could have expected to deceive me? Another official tells how a tall, well-built, muscular chief cowered before her. Having no knowledge of the language, I could not tell what it was all about. But plainly the man looked as if his very soul had been laid bare, and as though he wished the earth would open and swallow him. She combined most happily kindliness and severity, and indeed I cannot imagine any native trying to take advantage of her kindness and of her great-hearted love for the people. This is the most remarkable to any one with intimate personal acquaintance with the native, and of his readiness to regard kindness as weakness or softness, and his endeavor to exploit it to the utmost. All this court business added to her toil, as a constant stream of people came to her at the mission house in connection with their cases. She did not, however, see them all. It became her practice to sit in a room, writing at her desk or reading, and send the girls to obtain the salient features of the story. They knew how to question and what facts to take to her, as she sent them back with directions as to what should be done. When she was ill and feeble, she extended this practice to other palavars. People still came from great distances to secure her ruling on some naughty dispute, and having had their statements conveyed to her, she would either give the reply to the girls, or speak out the open window, deputation would depart satisfied, and act on her advice. Her correspondence also increased in volume, and she received many a curious communication. The natives would sometimes be puzzled as to how to address her, and to make absolutely sure, they would send their letters to Madame, Mr., Miss Slasser. Chapter 12 A Visitor's Notes A pleasant glimpse of her at this time is given in some notes by Miss Amos. On Miss Wright going home, she shortly afterwards married Mr. Rattree of the mission staff, both subsequently settling in England. Miss Amos was not permitted to stay alone in Okeyong, and she asked to be associated with Miss Slusser at Aikotobong. It was a happy arrangement for the latter. What a relief it is, she wrote, to have to have someone to lean on and share the responsibility of the barons. Miss Amess is so sane and capable and helpful, and is always on the watch to do what is to be done, a dear consecrated lassie. Miss Amess says, When I went to Calabar, I heard a great deal about Miss Slusser, and naturally I wished to see her. She had been so courageous that I imagined she must be somewhat masculine, with a very commanding appearance. 
but I was pleasantly disappointed when I found she was a true woman, with a heart full of motherly affection. Her welcome was the heartiest I received. Her originality, brightness, and almost girlish spirit fascinated me. What could not be long in her company without enjoying a right hearty laugh? As her semi-native house was just finished, she always did with the minimum of furniture and culinary articles. The council authorized me to take a filter, dishes, and cooking utensils from ACPAP, and I had also provisioned cases and personal luggage. I was not sure of what Ma would say about sixteen loads arriving, because there was no wardrobe or presses, and one had just to live in one's boxes. When Ma saw the filters, she said, You must have your filters nowadays. Filters were not created. They were an afterthought. She quite approved my having it all the same. Mail day was always a red-letter day. We only got letters fortnightly then. She was always interested in my home news and told me hers, so that we had generally a very happy hour together. Then the papers would be read and their contents discussed. To be with her was an education. She had such a complete grasp of all that was going on in the country. One day, after studying Efik for two hours, she said to me, Lassie, you've had enough of that today. Go away and read a novel for a short time. She was very childlike with her parents, and dearly loved them. One night I had to share her bed, and during the night felt her clapping me on the shoulder. I think she became so used with the babies that it was a force of habit, for she was amused when I told her of it the next morning. There was no routine with Ma. One never knew what she would be doing. One hour she might be having a political discussion with a district commissioner, the next supervising the building of a house, and later on judging native palavars. Late one evening, I heard a good deal of talking and also the sound of working. I went in to see what was doing, and there was Ma making cement and the Baron spreading on the floor with her hands in candlelight. The whole scene at so late an hour was too much for my gravity. When at prayers with her children, she would sometimes play a tambourine at the singing, and if the Barons were half asleep, it struck their curly heads instead of her elbow. Her outstanding characteristic was her great sympathy, which enabled her to get into touch with the highest and the lowest. Once while cycling together, we met the provincial commissioner. After salutations and some conversation with him, she finished up by saying, Goodbye, and see and be a good laddie. While well, walking one Sabbath, we came across several booths where the natives who were making the government road were living. While well, walking one Sabbath, we came across several booths where the natives who were making the government road were living. She began chatting with them, and then told them the parable of the lost sheep. She told everything in a graphic way, and with the perfect knowledge of the vernacular and they followed her with reverence and intense interest all through. To most of them, if not to all, that would be the first time they had heard of a god of love. She had really two personalities. In the morning, one would hear evildoers getting hotly lectured for their fashions, and in the evening, when all was quiet, she lifted one up to the very heights regarding the things of the kingdom. She always had a wonderful vision of what the power of the gospel could make of the most degraded, though bound by the strongest chains of superstition and heathenism. One might enter her house feeling pessimistic, but one always left it an optimist. Chapter 13. A Rest Home A touch of romance seemed to be connected with all her work. The next idea she sought to develop was rest house, or weekend, holiday, or convalescent home, where the ladies of the mission, when out of spirits or run down in health, could reside and recuperate without the fear of being a trouble or expense to others. In a tropical country, where a change in rest is so often essential to white workers, such a quiet, accessible resort would, she thought, prove a blessing. But there was no money for the purpose. One day, however, she received a check for twenty pounds. Years before, in Okiyang, Dr. Dunton of the Tropical School of Medicine had stayed with her for scientific study. He went on to the Congo and there succumbed. On going over his papers, his family found her letters and in recognition of her kindness and interest, sent a gift of twenty pounds. Thinking of a way of spending the money which would have pleased her friend, she determined to apply to the building of her rest house. The site for such a resort required to be near the creek, and she discovered one on high land at Yuse between Aikotabong and Aitu, and two miles from the landing beach. The road here winds round hills from which beautiful views are obtained. On this side one sees far into Aito, beyond Arachuku. On that, the vision is of Aitu, and the country behind it, while, on the west, the palm-covered plain rises into the highlands of Aikot Ekpen. It is one of the fairest of landscapes, but it is the haunt of leopards and other wild beasts, and after rain, the roadway is often covered with the marks of their feet. The ground was cleared, and building operations began, the plan worked out being a small semi-European village and native yard. Other cottages would follow. 
Before long, however, the feeling grew that Aikirubong should be taken over by the Women's Foreign Mission Committee, and she foresaw that use would require to be her own headquarters. Toward the end of the year, Miss E. McKinney, one of the lady agents, called at use and found her living in a single room, and sleeping on a mattress placed upon a sheet of corrugated iron. As the visitor had to leave early in the morning, and there were no clocks in the hut, Ma adopted the novel device of tying a rooster to a bed. The plan succeeded. At first crow, the sleepers were aroused from their slumber. It was not so much a rest house for others that was needed as a rest for herself. She was gradually coming to the end of her strength. Throughout the year 1906, she suffered from diarrhea, boils, and other weakening complaints. And the government doctor at last frankly told her that if she wished to live and work another day, she must go home at once. Her answer to this was to rally in a wonderful way. It seems, she said, as if God has forbidden my going. Does this appear as if he would not do without me? Oh, dear me, poor old lady, how little you can do. But I can at least keep a door open. It was, however, only a respite. By the end of 1907, she could not walk half a dozen steps. Her limbs refused to move, and she needed to be carried about. It was obvious, even to herself, that she must go home. Home. The very word brought tears to her eyes. The passion of the old land and kent faces, and the graves of her beloved grew with her failing power. A home picture made her heart leap and long. Oh, the dear homeland, she cried. Shall I really be there and worship in his churches again? How I long for a wee look at the winter landscape, to feel the cold wind, and to see the frost in the cart ruts, to hear the ring of shoes on the hard frozen ground, to see the glare of the shops and the hurrying, scurrying crowd, to take a back seat at a church, and hear, without the care of my own, the congregation singing, and hear how they preach and pray and rest their souls in the hush and solemnity. She arranged to leave in May, and set about putting her household affairs in order. The safeguarding of the children gave her some solicitude. For Jean and the older girls, she trembled. They must be left in charge of the babies, with only God to protect them. Dan, now six years old, she took with her as a help to fetch and carry. Her departure and journey was made wonderfully easy by the kindness of government officials, who vied with each other in taking care of her and making her comfortable. One of her friends, Mr. Gray, packed for her, stored her furniture, conveyed her to Duke Town, and asked his sister in Edinburgh to meet her. Mr. Middleton of Lagos wrote to say he was going home and would wait for her in order to convey her safely through all the foreign countries between Lagos and the other side of the Tweed. Now there, she wrote to the Wilkies, doth Job serve God for naught? Very grateful she was of all the attention. God must repay these men, she said, for I cannot. He will not forget they did it to a child of his, unworthy though she is. After the voyage, she wrote, Mr. Middleton has faithfully and very tenderly carried out all his promises. Had I been his mother, he could not have been more attentive or kind. Chapter 14 Scotland The Last Farewell A telegram to Mrs. McCriddle at Joppa informed her that her friend had arrived at Liverpool and was on her way to Edinburgh. She met the train and saw an old, wrinkled lady huddled in the corner of a carriage. Could that be Miss Lesser? With a pitying hand, she helped her out and conveyed her with Dan to the comfort of her home. But soon letters, postcards, invitations, parcels began flowing in. This correspondence, she wrote, is overwhelming. I cannot keep pace with it. There was no end to the kindness which people showered upon her. Gifts of flowers, clothes, and money for herself and her work, and toys for Dan were her daily portion. It is a wonderful service, this, she said, which makes the heart leap to do his will, and it is all unknown to the nearest neighbor or the dearest friend, but it keeps the kingdom of heaven coming every day anew on the earth. One five pound was slipped into her hand for the barons. My barons don't require it, she replied, and won't get it either, but it is put aside, till I see the board, as the nest egg of my home for girls and women in Calabar. If I can get them to give the woman or women, I shall give half of my salary to help hers, and will give the house and find the servants, and I can find the passage money from personal friends. Pray that the board may dare to go on in faith and take up this work. Between spells of colds and fever, she visited friends. At Bowden again, she had the exquisite experience of enjoying utter rest and happiness. A pleasant stay was at Stanley with the family of Miss Ames, who was also at home, and with whom she rose early in the morning and went out cycling. She cycled also with Miss Logie at Newport, but was very timid on the road. If she saw a dog in front, she would dismount and remount after she had passed it. She went over to Dundee and roamed through her former haunts with an old factory companion, looking wistfully at the scenes of her girlhood. 
I have been glad in she wrote to an English friend, at finding many of those I taught in younger days, walking in the fear and love of God, and many are heads of family who are a strength and ornament to the Church of Christ. About thirty-five or thirty-eight years ago, three ladies and myself began to work in a dreadful district. One became a district nurse, one worked among the fallen women and the prisoners in the prisons of our city, and one has been at home working quietly, and we all met in good health and had such a day together. We went up the old roads and talked of all God has done for us and for the people, and again dedicated ourselves to Him. It was probably the last time we should meet down here, but we are glad in the hope of eternity. She had not been in Scotland since the Union of the Churches, and one of her first duties was to call upon Mr. Stevenson, the secretary of the Women's Foreign Mission Committee, and his assistant, Miss Crawford. She had a high sense of the value of the work going on at the headquarters, and always maintained that the task of organizing at home was much harder than service in the field. But she had a natural aversion to officialdom, and anticipated the interviews with dread. She pictured two cold, unsympathetic individuals, a conception afterwards recalled with amusement. What the reality was may be gathered from a letter she wrote later to Mr. Stevenson. I have never felt much at home with our new conditions, and feared the result of the Union in all detail, though I most heartily approved of it in theory and fact. No, I shall not be afraid of you. Both Miss Crawford and yourself have been a revelation to me, and I am ashamed of my former fancies and fears, and I shall ever think of you, and pray for the secretaries, with a very warm and thankful heart. There was an element of humor in her meeting with Miss Crawford. The two women, somewhat nervous, stood on opposite sides of the office door. She without was afraid to enter, shrinking from the task of facing the unknown personage within, a woman who had been in India, and written a book, and was sure to be masculine and hard. She within, of gentle face and soft speech, leaned timidly on her desk, nerving herself with the coming shock, for the famous pioneer missionary was sure to be difficult and aggressive. When Mary entered, they glanced at one another looked into each other's eyes, and with a sigh of relief smiled, and straightway fell in love. When Mary gave her affection, she gave it with a passionate abandon, and Miss Crawford was taken into the innermost sanctuary of her heart. "'You have been one of God's most precious gifts to me on this firm,' she said later. In her humility, Miss Crawford spoke about not being worthy to tie her shoe. "'Dear daughter of the king,' exclaimed the missionary, "'why do you say that? If you knew me as God does, never say that kind of thing again. The ordeal of meeting the Women's Foreign Mission Committee was also a disillusionment. Her friend, Mr. Dr. Robson, was in the chair, and his opening prayer was an inspiration, and lifted the proceedings to the highest level. Nothing could have been kinder than her reception, which delighted her greatly. There was such a sympathetic hearing for the Calabar, especially from the old Free Church section, which was as eager for the mission as the old United Presbyterians. A conference was held with her in regard to the position of a Kodabong, and her heart was gladdened by the decision to take over the station and place two lady missionaries there, Miss Peacock and Miss Reed. At another conference with the subcommittee, she discussed the matter of the settlement, gave an outline of her plans, and intimated that already two ladies had offered one hundred pounds each to start the enterprise, while other sums were also on hand. The subcommittee was much impressed with the sense of both the necessity and promise of the scheme, and recommended the women's committee to express general approval of it, and earnest sympathy with the end in view and to authorize her to take the necessary steps on her return for the selection of a suitable site, the preparation of plans, an estimate of the cost of the ground, buildings, and agents, in order that the whole scheme might be submitted through the Mission Council, at the earliest practical date, for sanction. The General Committee unanimously and cordially adopted this recommendation. It was expected that she would address at many meetings throughout the country during her furlough to interest people in her work and projects but she astonished everyone by intimating that she was leaving for Calabar in October, although she had only been a few months at home. In her eyes, friends saw a look of sorrow, and said to one another that the burden of the work was lying upon her heart. But few knew the secret of her sadness. To some who remonstrated, she said, My heart yearns for my barons. They are more to me than myself. The truth was that a story about Jean had been set afloat by a native, and had reached her in letters, and she could hardly contain herself until she had found out the meaning of it. At all costs she must get back. Even her pilgrimage to the graves of her dear ones in Devon must be given up. Much against her will and pleading, she was tied down to give at least three addresses in the great towns. But with her whole being unhinged by the shadow that overhung her, she had little mind for public speaking. Her old nervousness in the face of an audience returned with tenfold force. I am trembling for the meeting, she wrote, but surely God will help me. It is his own cause." and again I am suffering tortures of fear, and yet why is it that I cannot rest in him? If he sends me work, surely he will help me to deliver his message, and to do it for his glory. He never failed me before. If he be glorified, that is all, whether I be considered able or not. She never prepared a set speech, 
and when she was going up to the Edinburgh meeting with Mrs. McCriddle, she turned to her and said, What am I to say? Just open your lips and let God speak, replied her friend. She was greatly pleased with the answer, and on that occasion she never spoke better. Dr. Robson presided, and Mrs. Duncan Malaren, in bidding her farewell on behalf of the audience, said, There are times when it needs God-given vision to see the guiding hand. We feel that our friend has this heavenly vision, and that she has not been disobedient to it. We all feel humbled when we hear what she and her brave colleagues have done. In God's keeping, we may safely leave her. At the meeting in Glasgow, the feelings were even more tense and emotional, and a hush came over the audience as the plain little woman made her appeal, and told them that in all probability she would never again be back. At the benediction she stood, a pathetic figure, her head drooping, her whole attitude one of utter weariness. On the eve of her departure she was staying with friends. At night they went into her room and found her weeping quietly in bed. They tried to comfort her, and she said half-whimsically that she had been overcome by the feeling that she was homeless, but without kent and kin lay in her own country. I am a poor solitary with only memories. But you have a troop of friend. You have us all, and we all love you. Yes, I can, and I am grateful, she replied, but wistfully. It's just that I have none of my folk to say good-bye to. She was very tired when she left. I am hardly myself in this country, she said. It has too many things, and it is always in such a hurry. I lose my head. Again, kind hands eased her way and settled her on the steamer. Dan was inconsolable and wept to be taken back to Joppa. The voyage gave her a new lease of life. The quietness and peace of meditation, the warm sunshine and the breezes, the loveliness of the sky and sea, rested and healed her. This despite the conduct of some wild passengers bound for the gold mines. One day she rose and left the table by way of protest, but in the end they bade her a kindly good-bye and listened to her advice. At Lagos the governor sent his aide-de-camp with greetings and a case of milk for the children. Mr. Gray also appeared and escorted her to Calabar. "'Am I not a privileged and happy woman?' she wrote to his sister. The same note of gratitude filled a letter which she wrote on board to Dr. Robson, asking him to put a few lines in the record, thanking everyone for their kindness, as it was impossible to answer all the letters she had received." This letter itself was inserted, and we give the concluding paragraph. To all who have received me into their homes, and given me a share of what are the most sacred things on earth, I give heartfelt thanks. What the Bethany house must have been to our Lord, no one can better appreciate than the missionary coming home to a strange place, homeless. I thank all those who have rested me and nursed me back to health and strength, and who have nerved me for future service by the sweet industries and hallowing influence of their home life. To the members of the mission board for their courtesy, their confidence, and sympathetic helpfulness, I owe much gratitude. And not only for services which can be tabulated, but for the whole atmosphere of sympathy which has surrounded me, for the hand clasp which has spoken volumes, for the looks of love which have beamed with eyes soft with feeling, for the prayer which has helped held and guided in days gone by, and on which I count for strength in days to come. All I pray that God may say to each giving sympathetic heart, inasmuch as ye did to one of the least of these, my brethren, ye did it unto me. She was praying all the while for her baron. On her arrival, as fast as boat would take her, she sped up to use. The chiefs and people came crowding to welcome her, bringing lavish gifts of food, yams, and salt, and fish, and fowl. There were even fifty yams and a goat from the back of Okeyong. Dan, with his English clothes with a scent of admiration, and and grave gray beard sat and listened to the tinking of his watch, and played with his toy train. To her unspeakable relief she found the story about Jean to be a native lie. She was too grateful to be angry. Chapter 15 Growing Weather The short furlough in Scotland, broken by so much movement and excitement, had done little permanent good. She was tired when she began her work, and there came a long series of up-and-down days which handicapped her activity. Yet she continued her duties with a resolution that was unquenched and unquenchable. Things are humdrum, she wrote, just like this growing weather of ours, rainy and cloudy, with a blink here and there. We know the brightness would scorch and destroy if it were constant. Still, the burst of glory that come between the clouds are a rich provision for our frail and sensitive lives. Her conception of achievement was a little out of the common. One day she sat in court for eight hours. Other two hours were spent with the clerk making out warrants. Afterwards she had to find tasks to employ some labor. Then she went out at dusk and attended a birth case all night, returning at dawn. Whole days were occupied with palavars, many of the people coming such a long distance that she had to provide sleeping accommodation for them. Old chiefs would pay her visits and stay for hours. It is a great tax, she remarked, but it pays even if it tires. Sundays were her busiest days. 
She went far afield preaching, and had usually from six to twelve meetings in villages and by the wayside. Often on these excursions she came across natives who had made the journey to Okyang to consult her in the old days. The situations were now reversed, for people from Okyang came to her. One day, after a ten-hour sitting in port, she went home to find about fifty natives from the hinterland of that district, waiting with their usual tributes of food and a pack of troubles for her to straighten out. It was after midnight before there was quiet and sleep for her. Her heart went out to these great-limbed, straight-nosed sons of the forest, and she determined to cross the river and visit them. She spent three days fixing up all their domestic and social affairs, and made a few proclamations, and diligently sowing the seeds of the gospel. When she left, she had with her four boys and a girl as wild and undisciplined as mountain goats, who were added to her household to undergo the process of training and educating ere they were sent back. In what she called her spare time, she was engaged in the endless task of repairing and extending her forlorn little shanties. There was always something on hand, and she worked as hard as the children, nailing up corrugated iron, sawing boards, cementing floors, or cutting bush. Jean, the ever willing and cheerful, was practically in charge of the house, keeping the babies, looking after their mothers, and teaching the little ones in the school. Up to this period she had never received more than her board, and Ma felt that it was time to acknowledge her service, and she therefore began to pay her one shekel per week. Now and again in her letters there came the ominous words, I'm tired, tired. On the last night of the year she was sitting up writing. I'm tired, she said, and have a few things to do. My mother went home eighteen years ago on the passage of the old year, so it is rather lonely tonight with so many memories. The barons are all asleep, but he hath not failed, and he is all sufficient. She was often so weary that she could not sit up straight. She was too exhausted to take off her clothes and brush her hair until she had obtained what she called her first rest. Then she rose and finished her undressing. She would begin a letter and not be able to finish it. The ladies nearest her, Miss Peacock and Miss Reed at Ikotabong, redoubled their attentions. Miss Reed, she said, was a bonny lassie, tenderly kind to me. What Miss Peacock was to her no one but herself knew. She had been a keen judge of character, though generous, almost extravagant in her praise of those she loved, and Miss Kit Peacock has justified her estimate and her praise. Sterling as a Christian, splendid as a woman, whole-hearted as a missionary, capable as a teacher. She is one after my own heart, she wrote. She is very good and kind to me, and a tower of strength. I am proud of her and the great work she is doing. Miss Peacock began the habit of about this time of cycling down on Saturday afternoons and spending a few hours with her and Mary looked forward to these visits with the greatest zest. The friends at home were also ceaseless in their kindness. They scrutinized every letter she sent, and were frequently able to read between the lines, and anticipate and supply her needs, much to her surprise. "'Have I been grumbling?' she would inquire. "'You made me ashamed. I am better off than thousands who give their money to support me. A carpet arrived. And, oh,' she writes, "'what a difference it has made to her comfort. You have no idea of the transformation. The mud and cement were transformed at once into something as artistic as the boards of the bungalow, and the coziness was simply beyond belief. It did not look a bit hot, and it was so soothing to the bare feet. I need not say it was a wonder to the natives who can't understand a white man stepping on a cloth, and such a cloth. On another occasion a bed was sent out to her, and she wrote, I have been jumping my tired body up and down on it just to get the beautiful swing, and to feel that I am lying level. I am tired, and I am happy and I am half ashamed of my own luxury. And next morning, what a lovely sleep I've had. The McGregors made their first visit to use in 1908, and on arrival found Ma sitting with a morsel of an infant in her lap. She was dressed in a print overall with low neck. It was tied at the middle with a sash, and she was without stockings or shoes. On the Sunday, she set out early on foot on her customary round, carrying two roasted corn cobs as her day's rations, whilst Mr. McGregor took the service at a Cotabong. He was tired after his one effort, but when he returned in the evening he discovered her preaching at Yu's church, her tenth meeting for the day, and her tour had not been so extensive as usual. At six o'clock next morning people had already arrived with palavars. One woman wanted a husband. Ma looked at her with a shrewd eye, the red people through and through, and then began in Scots, It's bad enough being a marriage register without being a matrimonial agent. Mr. McGregor sent up any of your laddies that are wanting wives. Then she went into Efik that made the woman wince, and pointed out that she had come to the wrong place. She watched with interest and progress the creek stations, although they were out of her hands. There were now at Okpo forty members and four men, and the contributions for the year amounted to forty-eight pounds. At Akane Obayo, where there were forty-five members in full communion, the total contributions amounted to ninety-eight pounds. And at Isang, there were one hundred and fifteen members. 
the contributions amounting to 146 pounds. At these three stations, the total expenses were fully met, and there was a large surplus. Where four years ago there was no church member and no offering, there were now 200 members, contributions amounting in all to 287 pounds. So the kingdom of her Lord grew. Mm -hmm.